Stephen. Is, it, is this on? Yes. Yes, good. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the Schemmel Forum's second annual University for a Day, featuring a sumptuous amount of food for thought, nourishment for the mind and heart. Together with your fellow students, uh, you will engage in a day of exercise, that is exercise for the mind, healthy, possibly exhausting, but guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be exhilarating. This year's University for a Day falls on Interdependence Day, a new commemorative occasion on the calendar which I had the honor of co-founding in 2003. Our launch of the day was at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, which was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. And our topic was, From Independence to Interdependence on the Continuum. Although I did not compel today's distinguished lecture, lecturers to lace their words of wisdom with interdependence rhetoric, it would have been a foolish to try, I felt obliged to mention to them that it is Interdependence Day and that it might or might not have some relevance to their lectures, we'll see. Simply put, Interdependence Day was a post 9-11 creation designated as a time to reflect on the realities of interdependence and the civic implications of those realities. Maybe it is another way of saying what the Abrahamic religions have said all along, that we should treat each other the way we like to be treated ourselves that we should attempt to understand and respect the differences among people. This is not a magic bullet capable of swiping out all kinds of hatreds and grudges, but it is a mindset that has been both pragmatic and moral, has both pragmatic and moral credence in our increasingly interdependent world. It's worth noting that our opportunities to cross borders and connect with the world today go far beyond what could have ever been imagined, and that can be both good and bad news. It is easier to do violence across borders by means of suicide bombers, weapons of mass destruction, or box cutters. At the same time, we have unprecedented powers of healing and peacemaking and international collaboration, and as important, just talking to each other because of the revolutionary advances in information and communications technologies. The magnitude of those advances is indescribable. It just about changes our world. Indeed, it makes it more important than ever to understand ourselves and others, which is why the Schemmel Forum resonates as a 21st century project. With this second university for a day, we hope that we are embedded, embedding the Schemmel habit into your lives by offering you the opportunity to savor the joys of learning together with scholars of distinction, co-learners who are as eager as you are to engage in this wondrous, wondrous realm of ideas. We'll start the program with one of the University of Scranton's most adept and engaging humanists. Who else do we know who can plunge into Homer's Odyssey and James Joyce's Ulysses and then move on to Toni Morrison's A Mercy without a blink? Who can teach freshmen and Shemalites with the same eagerness, luminosity, and impact? Without wasting another moment of his time with you, I'm pleased to present Stephen Whitaker, Professor of English and Theater at the University of Scranton. His topic, Toni Morrison, A Mercy. Toni Morrison's A Mercy, a paradigm and a cautionary tale of interdependence in the new world. Stephen. It's yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, Harmer. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, all of the people who make the Schemmel Forum happen. I should uh, tell you that I, I don't work from a lectern. I don't use a microphone. And I've been told to work from the lectern and use a microphone. So if my pedagogy seems like the pedagogy of a dog straining to break his leash, <laughs> don't be surprised. And this is, of course, a very intimate space. I had anticipated that, that there would be discussion and that the discussion could occur at any point in the process. So just shout out Southern Revival style. And um, I want to thank you all for coming out on this beautiful, cozy day. Uh, a lot of you have heard me talk about 
Toni Morrison before. I take that as a tribute to the fact that you're still trying to figure out what it is I have to say about Toni Morrison. Um, and I'm working on that myself, so we'll see if we make any progress. Do you guys hear a, a ringing, or is that just uh, something I'm doing? Because, Anthony, how far away can I get a, from this thing that, you, that it does what you need it to do? Can I be over here? Okay. Toni Morrison is our living literature Nobelist. This is her ninth book. I'm going to assume that some of you haven't read it or haven't finished reading it. Harmer said to me before we came in here that when we read Ulysses, Joyce's Ulysses together a year or so ago, the, one of the most valuable things I said was that you don't read Ulysses, you reread Ulysses. And uh, several people have said to me about a mercy, something which I experienced myself, which is when you first start reading it, you're, you're sure of very little except that you've been thrown right into the deep end. And I think it is another book that is a reread book. So, I will do a lot of plot explication probably in the next hour. And for those of you who know the book very well, I apologize. And for those of you who are afraid of spoilers, well, I'm going to spoil it. So, there you go. But that, that might make then the lecture count as a first read and your first read count as a reread, maybe. One of the things I love about Toni Morrison is that her life has been long. This is her ninth novel written when she's in her 70s. I work primarily on the Irish author James Joyce. And one looks at Joyce's career as an arc that begins with the modest stories of Dubliners builds and concludes with the legendary Finnegan's Wake. But Joyce referred to a book he was planning after Finnegan's Wake, which he said would be much simpler and clearer. He died. He died when he was younger than I am. With Toni Morrison, we get a much clearer picture of the large arc of a creative life. This book, if you, if you know her Pulitzer Prize winning book, Beloved, this book is tighter, shorter, more epigrammatic, but as powerful, I believe. One of the things that I love about Toni Morrison is that she is a researcher. She says, I don't want to imagine it. I want to know it. A funny thing for her to say, because all of her works are acts of imagining things that are distant from us in time or in culture or in both. What she means by that is that, say, for a book like A Mercy, she researched it for two years before writing it. And she says in an interview, the danger was that I would never start writing it, and that that's always the danger for her. And so as a scholar, I like to hear that, that one of the greatest writers of our time is also in love with doing research. She tells a particular story about having written a scene for a mercy in which a wild hog is hunted down and field dressed. Those of you who have field dressed an animal know that that's a, an interesting and very specific process. Uh, if any of you are teachers, it's, it's very much like grading a stack of papers. 
As she had completed the scene after much research, she discovered when wild hogs were introduced into the new world by German sportsmen. Alas, after the time of her novel. Uh, and so, of course, that scene is changed in dramatic ways. For example, the star animal uh, had to be shifted, and then the technique had to be re-understood. One of the things I love about Toni Morrison is the cumulative effect of her work. For me, this book is the fictional completion of a trilogy. The two preceding would be the Pulitzer Prize winner, and then a much shorter book called Jazz. The Pulitzer Prize winner, those of you who know it, is set to bridge the American war between the states. Uh, it tells a terrifying story. Like A Mercy, it features a house that is somehow haunted, that demands to be able to tell its story. And the story, I guess perhaps I will try to avoid sp any spoilers on the earlier book. The story it tells is of horrible choices and the circumstances that force us to make horrible choices. Jazz, of course, looks at a period better than half a century later, set in urban New York in the jazz age. And it's a very different look at American culture. But they're connected. Both of them are attempts on her part to try to understand who we are as Americans. When you read A Mercy, and you get to that mysterious final chapter, that chapter whose voice is just impossible, the way uh, Mercy is set up is it's a kind of choral work in which there is one speaker who speaks always in the presence and always in a lyrically simplified English. And that speaker telling her story, always in the present tense, alternates with a more traditional narrator. And that more traditional narrator in each of that narrator's sections tells you the backstory on some or other character, whether it's Vark or Rebecca or Lena or Sorrow or Scully or whomever. But then comes that last chapter, and it's the impossible chapter, because it's the voice of Florin's mother. And it's her mother explaining to her why she, in a variation of Sophie's choice, gave up her daughter to Vark and clung to her son. Part of the heartbreak of the book is you don't know that Lena ever understands this. But the chapter raises a question for us, and that is, what do we need to know to know who we are? One of the things I love about Toni Morrison is that she's also a scholar. She's also a theoretician. She's written a book called Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. And it is one of the most important theoretical treatises on American literature there is. And in Playing in the Dark, She talks about what she calls the Africanist presence in American culture and in American literature. And what I want to do today is 
take apart her thinking on this and try to lay some of it out for you uh, and then try to connect that with the strategies of a mercy. What she does in Playing in the Dark is look at a fellow female American author, Willa Cather, uh, and take one of her books apart. Uh, the book is Safira and the Slave Girl. And uh, if you're a Cather groupie, as I am, uh, I was in the Southwest this summer for one of my sons wedding and from there drove out to Santa Fe to visit the church which is at the center of Cather's death comes from the archbishop. The archbishop uh, of the title is actually buried in the church and it's a wonderful, wonderful pilgrimage. Toni Morrison respects Willa Cather and admires her work and learned a lot of her craft from her. But she takes Cather to task for what Morrison believes is the incompetence of Safira and the Slave Girl. And in taking it to task, because she respects Cather, she tries to understand what it was that caused Cather to fail so pitifully in imagining the events of the novel. The events of the novel just schematically are, uh, it's set in the, in the antebellum South and it features uh, a family and the family includes uh, a, a black woman who is the servant of a white woman who is um, uh, sickly. And the black woman has a daughter. The white woman has a husband and an extended family. And the core of the novel is the black woman's decision to sacrifice her daughter to the white woman, to her needs, to her fears, to her anxieties. And for those of us who, who love Cather, it's, it's nobody's favorite book. Uh, but I guess most of us never quite were able to articulate why. And what Morrison says is, well, the problem with the book is these aren't real characters. This is incredible. The, the emotional uh, imagination of the black woman who sacrifices her daughter is utterly unrealistic, utterly uncompelling. And Morrison then says, I didn't really see this when I read the book as a scholar. I, I, I came to understand it when I tried to read the book as a maker of novels as I tried to imagine myself being Cather, writing this book, and then I could see why Cather couldn't understand the dynamic of this family, and it was because, she said, Cather was unable to imagine black experience. This is her, this is Morrison's beginning point in thinking about how the dominant white culture thinks about black culture. Or if I can put that somewhat differently, how the uses to which the dominant white culture puts its ideas about black culture. Now what she then does in, in Playing in the Dark is a, a perspectival shift. Uh, she she does something very much like what happens to you when you look at an Escher drawing where the stairs appear to be going up but then suddenly are clearly going down. She wants us to see 
how the dominant white culture's general ignoring of black culture is not just a, an omission, but that act of ignoring is a central and defining feature of the white culture. Now, the reason I'm talking about this today is because we're talking about how it is that cultures interact with each other. And w you might say that Morrison is attacking the sort of liberal ideas of, well, everybody is nice and everybody's nice together and we all love each other and, and you know, sure there was bad stuff, but we're all just going to get past that and, and go on with our lives. And Morrison seems to be suggesting that, that that's not enough for us to really know ourselves. This goes back to the question of the last chapter of a mercy. What is, it, what is really necessary for us to understand our lives? So she starts looking for how the concept of blackness was essential to founding the concept of whiteness in American culture. At this point, I want to stop back a little bit. She says, pointedly, that racial distinctions and stereotypes are not unique to American culture. They are all over Europe, all over Africa, all over the world. Uh, one of the things I love about Toni Morrison is she always wants to tell the truth, but she's never interested in punishing anyone. Uh, it's a remarkable restraint, I think. OK, let's look at this idea of racial stereotyping. Uh, the Greeks had slaves, but their slaves were, as often as not, other Greeks. You got a slave by conquering their town, and they became a source of free labor. The Iliad, the war between the Greeks and the Turks, the, uh, features the return of many Greeks with many Turkish slaves. Uh, a lot of Greek tragedy is an examination of the consequences of this. I'm thinking of the Oresteia and other things. But the Greeks did have notions of racial stereotypes. Um, one of the books I get to teach in the SGLA program is Plato's Phaedrus. This is a book from 2,400 years ago. In the Phaedrus, the Phaedrus is basically a discussion of how do you move people with words? And the assertion that Plato makes in Phaedrus is, well, words act on the soul. And so you have to study how words work, and you have to study how the soul works. Further, he says, different people have different kinds of souls, different things that you can appeal to. Uh, Plato was not egalitarian in the sense that everybody is exactly the same. He would take the fact that some people are born with a taste for and a capacity for music, and some people are born for a taste for and a capacity for sport as to be a difference in their souls, which is a kind of a neat idea. He says, though, generally, the soul works like this. And this is, this is a picture that Freud picks up exactly. But in his attempt to make it more scientific, he drops the imagery that Plato uses and instead puts in some, some Latin descriptors. What Plato says is, well, I could tell you what the soul is really like, but we haven't got time. So I'm going to give you a model of it. The soul is like a chariot driver in a chariot drawn by two horses. One horse is the horse of reason, of goodness, and the other horse is the horse of passion, of disorder.
And according to Plato, everybody's soul is like this. And according to Plato, what happens to you when you grow up is you try to figure out, how can I keep this damn team on the, on the road? Because on the one hand, I've learned from my culture, my tribe, my nation, that this is good, and this is how I should behave. On the other hand, I have this inborn rascal who just wants to go ahead and eat the cake and go to sleep in the middle of the day. And somehow, my little life task is to bring these things into some kind of balance. Freud, of course, picks this up, the, the, the irrational horse is the id, and it's inborn. Freud's description of it is, except for it being a horse, just like Plato's, although Freud does call it a drive. And the good horse, of course, the horse, of course, the good horse, of course, <laughs> is the superego. And as Freud says, it's learned, it's acquired from one's acculturation. And then the problem of the individual, the ego, the I, is to how to balance these two forces. Okay. So it looks exotic when it's in Plato's language, but when it's Freud's language, it's, it's fairly obvious. Now, 3,400 years ago, when Plato is describing this distinction, he uses some interesting imagery. The good horse is white. It has a noble brow. It's got an aquiline nose. It is upright. Its limbs, I, you can see the Greek statuary sort of ideal here. And the, the horse of the bodily drives of desire, of ir irrationality, is dark and its lips are thick and its nose is flat. From the get-go, from the get-go, we have a racial stereotype being put in the very modeling of the soul. Now, Plato might say in his own defense, but, but I'm saying that these are forces within everybody. But that doesn't keep us from seeing that he's resorting to stereotypes. And he's resorting to them in a way that virtually no one ever comments on. Virtually no philosopher or, or historian of philosophy ever comments on this, this stereotyping. When you read jazz, it's after Reconstruction. It's after much of the upheaval, social upheaval surrounding the First World War. Uh, many of the characters have moved to Harlem from the South to escape the horrors of Jim Crow and the culture of, of lynching. And she, it's as if she's trying to reach back and say, where did we come from? And in Beloved, she reaches back even further and looks at a, a bridging of the war between the states and what happens to Setha and her daughter Beloved when they were slaves and then after they are freed. And in both of those books, the ideology of slavery is already in place. I'm going to explain that term. But if you know a mercy, you'll remember when Florence says to the blacksmith, I'm yours, you own me. And he says, own yourself, woman. He is a free black man who makes his living according to his skills. Uh, he sees in her slavery not just an economic arrangement, but the expression of an ideology, 
a way of understanding her own nature. And that's what ultimately abhors him. So this key distinction then is between slavery as an economic arrangement and slavery as an ideology. Now, you may remember from your Philosophy 101 class that a, an ideology is a system of ideas whose function it is to make social arrangements look like they are products of nature. So if an ideology is working, whatever the social arrangement is, you won't think, oh, well, this is a social arrangement. You'll think, oh, this is nature. This is the natural way for it to be. So what the iron worker is saying to Florence is, you think your enslavement is natural, but it's not. OK, this is a difficult idea. You could argue that the reason that Morrison had to write A Mercy is because she had to think all the way back before slavery was an ideology. She wanted to think all the way back to the point at which it was a economic arrangement. So we follow the central male white character Vark, and we see the tragedy of his succumbing to the temptations of free labor. When we first meet him, he's scandalized by Senor Ortega. He's scandalized by the, what he takes to be the Catholic Weltanschauung, the Catholic worldview of, of self-indulgence and license. And he sees that, he sees Ortega as enjoying living so well off of other people's labor. And Vark, although he is not much in the way of a churchgoer and specifically looked for a wife who was unchurched, he still has the basic Protestant vision of self-dependence and self-independence so that when he looked at slavery, he was horrified by it. But then we see him admire Ortega's property and his quality of life and his house and his grounds and his gate. And he hears about no end of coin to be made in the Carib off of kill devil, rum, sugar. When I lived in the farming country of Indiana, farmers used to have bumper stickers that said, said, I raise corn and market it as beef. Because <laughs> they had their own feedlots. Uh, the thing with sugar in the economy of the new world was uh, I raise sugar and market it as rum. And he is, Vark is seduced. And so we see this, mm, perhaps one European impulse to resist the culture of slavery uh, seduced by uh, the luxury that it afforded to the slave owner. And Vark comforts himself that, well, these slaves won't actually be at my house. They'll be, I'll just own an interest. I'll have a corporate holding in this process. I won't actually have the slaves in my house. And what Morrison shows us is a culture in which almost everybody is a slave of one kind or another. And further, almost everybody in the book is an orphan. I said before, she wants to tell the truth, but she's not trying to hurt anyone. She's trying to see how it worked. And in her, under her gaze, all Americans are orphans in some way. And almost all of them were in some form of near slavery. And we can tick them off if we want to. We can talk about Scully and his, the terms of his indenture 
which were based on a document which he couldn't read and based on numbers which he couldn't remember and which could be amended unilaterally by his master any time his master decided that Scully did something that he didn't like. We see Lena, whose tribe is slaughtered, whose village is burned down, who is struggling to understand her own experience by rewriting her Native American myths in terms of her more recent experience. We see Florins literally chattel. We see Rebecca. She's an interesting character. She's not a slave. Well, there is unavoidably a feminist dimension to this here book. She thinks to herself as she's traveling to the new world in answer to an advertisement, which her father put her up for in part because the advertisement included the promise that expenses would be paid. And I think what we're to imagine there is that that expense account is gonna be pretty heavily padded so he more or less effectively sells his daughter. And his daughter travels across in the company of women who are either indentured or prostitutes being exported. She's the only one who's going to a marriage. And she thinks to herself about the options for women. And she thinks, well, I could be a slave, or I could be indentured, or I could be a, a prostitute, or I could be a wife. And she thinks to herself, all in all, I think wife is probably the best deal. Maybe a little more security. Uh, we know, of course, that even by the time of the founding of the country, formally by the founding fathers, uh, women's rights weren't all that they might be in terms of, oh, I don't know, citizenship, property, legal rights, rights to representation. Um, what other rights are there? Yeah, that's, that's about it. So that um, women, like black people, are virtually excluded in the Constitution, except in unfortunate ways. So she comes over and we could say, well, she's a free woman and she gets to do whatever she wants, but no, she's not a free woman. She doesn't get to do whatever she wants. And when she sees Vark, and he seems to be a nice guy, she is overwhelmed with her sense of good fortune, good luck didn't have to work this way. Nothing she did would affect how it worked. So she just thought she was incredibly lucky. And to be fair, Vark felt the same when he saw her. He felt, oh my gosh, I'm the luckiest man who ever lived. We see him, he's liter literally an orphan. We see him when he's dealing with Ortega, which, who is at that point living in a protectorate of the last Stuart king. Um, and Vark thinks, I can never take Ortega to court because he's a Catholic and I'm not. And this place is owned by the Catholic king and it's run by Catholics. He says their, their priests walk openly. He says their places of worship menace the town square. So he realizes in his limited way that he has very few legal rights in this place. He even realizes that the only thing that would keep Ortega from cutting him down with his sword, were he to be wearing it, would be that it would affect his bond rating, 
Well, you know, the last guy who loaned him money, he killed. Okay, but he, Farc is pretty sure that's the only restraint on Ortega's violence. So we have a world in which arguably everybody is enslaved. Now, interdependency. We have three fairly distinct cultures, native, European, African. And we have this discovery that for the African culture, the surprise, the surprise of Florin's mother was to find herself being called negrita, being reduced to her skin color because she thought of herself as a member of a particular family, of a member of a particular tribe, coming from a particular region, speaking a particular language. And that, that family, that tribe, that region, and that language were all distinct from their neighbors. Their cultures were distinct. And she finds herself washed into just the color of her skin. And this requires us then to look at the terms of servitude of the various groups that are in service here. Hers is the only group from the beginning that has no even nominal end date of service. Hers is the only group which from the beginning sees its offspring subject to a continuation of the dependence. It's clear when it's talked about a child being used to serve out the rest of an indenture bond that that's a shady deal and that nobody really would expect that to happen or approve of it. On the other hand, Florence is, of course, born into slavery because her mother is a slave. But even that doesn't yet make it a complete ideology. That's just a law. It's a social arrangement. It's an economic engine, free labor. We're told right before the time of this action, 1690, by the way, that, that, that Catholic king is, is, is not going to die, he's gonna have a, a son, and that's gonna cause the, the Protestant barons in England to dethrone him and drive him out. And he flee, flees to Ireland, which doesn't work out so well for Ireland. But, Harmer warned me not to make this be about Dublin, so I'll. <laughs> but just let me say, from the standpoint of Irish studies, this year, 1690, is, of course, when the hammer comes down on Ireland. It's, it's the point in which England begins the so-called penal laws. The king is, the Catholic king is driven out, and, but anyway, meanwhile, back in the New World, the New World, which has only the name of a continent or the name of particular settlements. No one imagines it as a country, even in Potentia. But two things have just happened when we meet Vark going to Maryland to see Ortega. One, a, a series of laws have been passed which make it, uh, because there's been an uprising, uh, which make it legal for, as she summarizes it, or as he summarizes it in his head, uh, virtually any white man to kill virtually any black man under virtually any circumstances. This was, uh, law that was set up in response to a rebellion. The rebellion was not of black slaves alone. It was also of people in 
various systems of indenture. And they made common cause and they rebelled. Now what's interesting, of course, is the law did not allow the liberal killing of people in indenture. That's one of those important little distinctions that has more long-term effect than might be initially obvious. That meant that the natural alliance between all of these people who are in some kind of ir irrational, interminable service, that natural alliance is being split there. It would be like if you had a lot of protests to a draft, you might have draft numbers and then the people with really high numbers would go home and do something else instead of protesting because they felt like they were sort of out of it. No one would do anything that cynical, but um, he finds himself and he says basically there's, this is not law, this is license. This is, this is license to, to practice incredible barbarity in the name of civilization. She brings us to this cusp point where the new world is really the old world still, but it's happening here. And its, it's various values and forces are really struggling with each other. And she tries to get us to see what is it that, no, hey Steve, come in, that what is it that nudged this economic arrangement, which was part of a spectrum, into a, manic, a, a binary way of seeing it. That's what she wants to know. What, what makes it a, a system of ideas that basically allows, by the time you get to Beloved, Setha is referred to by her white captors as not human. Now, for all of Ortega's corruption and cruelty, there's no indication at all that he doesn't think of his slaves as human. But by the time we get to Beloved, 150 years later, these, these same people are now ideologically not human. They're not us. Implicit in all of this, is Morrison's idea that when we talk about the foundation of the United States, we talk about the idea of individual liberty, Jeffersonian principles, Hume, Locke, the various philosophers who thought about it. Morrison is gently suggesting to us that it was much easier to think, I am not subject to the king. I am not subject to what my father was. I, I am able to pursue my own happiness. It was much easier to think those radical terms if one was also thinking, if not saying, because I am not black. And that's the point at which blackness undershores the whole concept of whiteness in American culture. One of the things that we all who think about the founding of the country meditate on is Jefferson. Uh, I had an anthropology teacher who wrote this essay once called Why Frogs Are Good to Think. And her point about frogs was not the French but the amphibians, um, that they're neither one thing nor another. Their amphibiousness makes them a wonderful way for us to think about habitats and, and what it means to be a certain kind of animal. Jefferson is, uh, is good to think. Uh, as a as a white liberal, I'm tempted to say, well, you know, uh, yes, he, there's a lot of unfortunate stuff there, but he did write these documents which are the foundation of the eventual 
freedom of the slaves and the eventual equality in our society, even though he himself, I want to put this as delicately as possible, owned his lover and owned their children as chattel property. Morrison would have us think about that a little more clearly and suggest that, well, sure, but he had a blind spot, but, but he was really noble. Uh, she would have us think that his nobility is predicated on that blind spot. It's predicated on the idea that, of course, I am not a woman, I am not a child, and I am not black. And those categories are, if we were to do a Venn diagram of overlap, those categories would all be sort of over here together, and then there would be propertied white male over here. And the definition of propertied white male would be, I'm not a child, I'm not a woman, I'm not black. But of course, I'm not going to say that. And I might not even think it. That's the great thing about ideology. And ideology is a great little machine. Because what an ideology does is allow people who are disadvantaged by the social arrangement to actually be in charge of supporting the social arrangement. And so we see that people of all classes, genders, orientations, routinely conspire in maintaining the system of ideas, which contributes to their second class status. Now, the reason I'm talking about this aspect of this book today is because when we talk about interdependence, when we talk about nations and the interactions between nations and the cooperation between nations, we have to ask the question of the last chapter of this book. What do we need to know to be free? What do we need as Americans to understand about ourselves to be able to interact with the rest of the world? And Morrison's lesson is that one of the things we need to know is that Things which may seem almost non-existent to us may be, in fact, the most important things that we may have carefully learned not to think about certain aspects of ourselves. A pretty broad idea, I'll grant you, uh, 